together for a new Jersey comeback. And the first lady tells us how the governor worked his way through this crisis. Plus, the attorney general, the president of PSE&G, and a big new change at Rutgers. It's all ahead on NJ Today. Major funding for NJ Today provided in part by New Jersey Manufacturers. New Jersey Manufacturers, auto insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. New Jersey Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njar.com. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. And by PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. Now stay tuned for NJ Today. From our satellite bureaus, our partners in newsrooms and on college campuses across the state, and from the production studios of Montclair State University, this is NJ Today with Mike Schneider. Hello once again. There was a rather unusual scene in Trenton today, a meeting that many would have considered inconceivable just a few weeks ago. Political rivals, people who rarely spoke to one another, joining together to help us heal. NJ Today's Darry Kotzker has our report. In a State House boardroom, the entire New Jersey congressional delegation, including Senators Menendez and Lautenberg, met with Governor Christie to discuss post-Hurricane Sandy aftermath. They spoke of strategies and issues confronting New Jersey as they move ahead with the recovery. Regardless of party, regardless of previous battles that we've had with each other, um, everybody around this table stood up and, and called and asked, what do we need? How can they help? and also were out in the field working with their constituents to make sure that those people were dealt with. And um, I think New Jersey set an example for the rest of the country on how to work across party lines together in times of real challenge to our people. And uh, the men and, uh, and women around this table um, are, are folks who deserve great credit for that, and I, I thank them for it. After the 90-minute meeting was adjourned, the governor and most of the delegation were not available for interviews. However, Congressman Frank Pallone told us that topics included housing for displaced New Jerseyans, upgrading power grids, beach restoration, and how this hurricane has national ramifications. The bottom line is I think everyone understands that, you know, with, with the fact of these storms becoming more frequent and occurring in different parts of the country, you know, this shouldn't be something that's looked at on a regional basis. Earlier today, members of the congressional delegation sent letters to the Obama administration asking for unspecified funding for the completion of Army Corps of Engineers projects. Congressman Pallone says he expects estimates from Hurricane Sandy damage to be available in a week or so. We have a responsibility at the federal level to make sure that the funding is available uh, for these various programs, whether it's you know dune restoration or it's housing or it's uh, rebuilding. And I think it was a very good meeting. We are going to work together to make sure that the citizens of New Jersey um, are treated fairly and equitably in this process, and that they certainly are treated um, in, a, in the same manner that uh, victims were treated in like situations, like Katrina, um, the citizens of Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. The state also wants FEMA to pay for 90% of the cost of Sandy cleanup and recovery instead of 75%. Pallone said the state is working with FEMA to get trailers for residents, but it's still unclear how many will be needed. He also added that people will start moving into Fort Monmouth after Thanksgiving. There's still no estimate for the number of people left homeless by Hurricane Sandy. For NJ Today, I'm Darry Kotzker in Trenton. Big change is coming to Rutgers. University officials announcing today that they're moving their athletic programs out of the Big East in a couple of years and into the Big Ten. This is considered a big move, a big step up, a lot of money at stake here. And some say this could transform Rutgers into a national football power. We're really very excited and very proud here at Rutgers. The Big Ten is really where Rutgers belongs. It's a transformative day for Rutgers University and transformative in so many ways. The Big Ten Conference is the ultimate academic neighborhood to live in. And we're now in that neighborhood with like-minded institutions, peer schools. This is not just about collaboration on the fields of play. This is about collaboration at every level. 
Other news for you. Calls mounting now for the resignation of Hamilton Mayor John Ben Suvengo. He was convicted today on bribery charges for allegedly taking $12,000 to help an insurance broker win a school district contract. So far, no comment from the mayor. He's set to be sentenced in February and faces up to 20 years in prison. New developments now in the ongoing dispute between Assemblyman Paul Moriarty and a Washington Township police officer who ticketed him last summer for allegedly driving under the influence. Moriarty denied that charge. He's accused the officer, Joseph Bonaventura, of official misconduct. Last month, it seems, a judge found probable cause against the officer. And today we learned that the officer has been suspended with pay ever since. There was a big drug bust announced today in North Jersey. The Attorney General, Jeff Chiesa, says his investigators joined forces with federal drug agents and local police to take down a major heroin network based in Patterson and Prospect Park, with operations all over the Northeast. Chiesa says they confiscated three kilos of heroin with a street value of one million dollars, and he says suspects are in custody. And joining us now is the Attorney General, Jeff Chiesa. Welcome. Good to thank, have you thank back. Thank you, Mark. Good back. In, in terms of heroin, I mean, there's a part of us that remembers the old days of the, the French Connection. And, and many people, I think, think heroin is a thing of the past. This obviously shows it isn't. It's not. And today we made an announcement, 17 arrests, um, two of them are fugitives, but a large-scale heroin wing in, operating in Patterson, uh, supplying, uh, not, not selling to the, the street level, but supplying the dealers so that the, the dealers were able to, to supply people in northern New Jersey and, and actually in other states. This was a large-scale operation. So we've gotten kind of to the top of it um, to eliminate the, the supply that gets it out to the street dealers and, and the people that want to sell it. And it's such an awful, disruptive, addictive substance. Um, so it's not, not only is it not gone, it, it's, it's something we keep a very close eye on. We had an announcement earlier in the year in Camden where we dealt with a heroin case, and there's been other cases that have been done. But it's especially important because it's one of the things that people turn to uh, when they have a prescription drug addiction because it's a cheap alternative that sort of gives you that same kind of high. And uh, when we, what we've seen in some of the uh, literature and the studies that we've reviewed is that when people uh, develop a prescription drug addiction, they will uh, turn to heroin because it's more available and it's cheaper and it'll give them that, that very short-term high. It's an, it, it, obviously, it's incredibly addictive and it creates a, it, it's a catastrophic impact on the communities that it's in because of the gun violence that follows it. And it just creates a, a terrible uh, environment for anybody to live in, live in those communities. This alleged network that was broken up, these arrests, uh, is this something, how long has this been around? Is this something that they, these uh, drug entrepreneurs, if you will, spotted a new opportunity or they've been doing it for a while? Our investigation has been going on for six months. So the Division of Criminal Justice, which is in my office, the DEA, the Passaic County Sheriff's Department and the state police all working together. So we put a lot of resources into this and a lot of time into it. And it's hard to say. Um, it, certainly, we know it was there at the time of our investigation. We got the information. And we know based upon the searches that we've done, we, we've, done we've recovered three kilos of, of heroin and $255,000 in cash. So you think about the amount of volume that they were doing, the amount of money they were making. This was a very sophisticated, very entrenched operation. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how long it would have been there. Our investigation will continue. We'll, we'll develop more of that information, but it was certainly a, a very high-volume operation. Is this the kind of thing where, I mean, I know you can't get into details about how you learn about these things, or maybe you can. A tip or, or somebody turned uh, and decided to turn these guys in? You know, I, I don't want to say specifically in this case, but it, it happens in many, many different ways. Um, it could be um, conduct that you see that's unusual. For example, in one of the cases that we did, we saw... Uh, people walking out of one of these drug mills, and it's a residence, but we call it a drug mill because that's where they're putting the drugs together and packaging them up, walked out of it with a, an apron and a surgical mask on, came out to take a cigarette break, took the surgical mask down, and that's the kind of thing you'll see. Now, we saw that on some of our surveillance. So it's all kinds of behavior. You may, you may just see a st certain steady flow of repeat people coming in and out of the house at odd hours. It could be all kinds of things that you see, but we're on the lookout for any kinds of behavior. And obviously the, the investigators that do these cases, and they're the ones that deserve all the credit, they're experts. And they develop informants and they develop leads and they develop all kinds of things. But there are cases, in my own experience, I had corruption cases developed from very small drug cases. So it, it's hard to tell where your cases are going to come from. The people who are buying this stuff, this heroin, uh, who are using it as an alternative, as you said, to prescription meds. Um, are these your classic, stereotypical drug abusers? Or are these different kinds of people from all walks of life? Well, it, it, it's a 
it can be, it can be anybody, right? It can be anybody, any human being can be impacted by the improper use of prescription drugs because they're so addictive, which is why we've been so aggressive on that front. So it's, it's in urban communities and certainly the heroin permeates into suburban communities because of ex one of the, that, the point of mm. prescription drug abuse turning to heroin abuse. Is the success that you're having in cracking down on the misuse or abuse of prescription medications leading to this in a way? Well, it's, it, they're, they're, they're inextricably linked because of the pattern that you, we've seen in, in people moving from one to the other. So it's best that we try to address it on all fronts. So we try to educate and, and put people in the best position with prescription drug abuse, and we try to be on the lookout for the, the heroin mills and the heroin distribution. In a way, well. uh, pardon the illusion, but it's almost like that old kid's game of whack-a-mole where you hit them down in, in one area, they pop up someplace else, and where do they go from here? Sure. In this case, we, again, we spent six months and a lot of resources. We took a, a, a big supplier out of this network. Now, I can't guarantee that someone else isn't going to come in there, but they should know that the penalties, the leader of this network, the Segundo Garcia, is facing life in prison, 25 years of no parole, as one of his counts. So this is serious. The other people are facing first and second degree charges. So these are people that are going to go to jail for a very long period of time. That's, that's the other message people need to understand. We understand there's a quick buck to be made in some of this stuff, but the penalties are se severe, and we have to be aggressive with the way we go after these cases and the way we prosecute them. And thanks to the work that went on in this case, we'll be able to do that. Attorney General Jeff Chiesa, so much more to talk about. We have to leave it there for now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Support for the business report provided by AAA, travel, financial services, insurance, roadside assistance, and more. Online at AAA.com. Business confidence, it is up in the Garden State. 20% of the companies polled by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association say they expect to increase their hiring next year. That's up from 15% this past year. And fewer companies, conversely, are talking about downsizing. In fact, most of them say sales and profits are up this year and business confidence higher than it's been in five years. They are trying to rebuild their confidence down the shore. It has been a disaster for commercial fishermen, literally. And our Lauren Wonka went to sea if they're ready to head back out to sea. This is the first time commercial fisherman Gary Stone is back to work at the Belford Seafood Cooperative since Sandy made landfall over three weeks ago. If we don't land any fish on a dock, we don't make any money. That's why Stone headed to Montauk right after the storm hit. He needed an operational dock and ice machine. Well, I got 10000 a month in bills and five kids to feed. I can't say, I can't. Can you work for, stay home for three weeks? I can't. If I don't work, the bills don't get paid. Sandy, Sandy hit Belford harder than any storm ever hit back in history. Sandy came in one end of the building and went out the other and took all the doors out took the refrigeration, the electrical. Uh, it was just a total, total devastation. The fishermen are grateful none of the boats were damaged, but everything else was destroyed. General Manager Joseph Brennan says the co-op is operating on last summer's profits and the loss of their entire fishing market, which is typically open seven days a week, is a devastating blow. This is what's left of the Belford Seafood Co-op's restaurant. Everything was washed away by the storm. But Brennan says despite this destruction, he hopes the restaurant will be rebuilt and operational by May or June. We had a deck here that seated 100 people for dinner at our part of the restaurant, which is, as you can see, gone. And it's over in the parking lot about 400 yards away. Commercial fisherman Roy Deal has worked in the industry for 30 years. It'll be a couple of weeks to get the money coming back in, so we'll probably be looking at uh, middle of December before a first paycheck. It's devastating. Everybody's devastated around here. How are we going to go to work? There's no way to go to work here. Brannon hasn't determined the overall cost of the damage. He says every day the team picks up the pieces and works to rebuild. <laughs> When the fishermen aren't at the co-op making repairs, many are home, trying to salvage whatever Sandy didn't take from them. As for Stone, he says he's determined to stay strong for his family and fight what often feels like an uphill battle. we got to keep climbing or we're going to fall down. For NJ Today, I'm Lauren Wonko in Belfort. 
Well, the hurricane is long gone, but the work continues for New Jersey's battered utility companies. And joining us now from the Star-Ledger newsroom is the president and chief operating officer of PSE&G, Ralph LaRosa. Mr. LaRosa, good of you to join us. At this point, how would you, how would you characterize uh, your system's comeback from the storm? Uh, nice to be here, Mike. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. We're, we're still really in recovery mode. While uh, we're pretty proud of the effort, and uh, not everything was 100% perfect, but pretty proud of the effort to bring the 1.7 million customers back. But the system is still uh, held together with some Band-Aids in certain spots, and my biggest concern remains a lot of our substations and switching stations that were under salt water, because we all know that salt water and metal don't mix, and it's just a matter of time before we have some challenges there. So we're actively pursuing a, a replacement strategy for some of those assets. How, how quickly and, and how economically does it does that process, I mean, it's probably not just picking up a box and putting it in. Do these systems have to be rebuilt, or can you actually order out and get one delivered? Well, yeah, it's a combination of both. Sometimes you have to rebuild them in place, and we're in the process of doing that where we can, where we need to replace parts, some big, uh, big pieces of equipment, whether it be transformers or voltage regulators or some of the other equipment in those stations. We are placing some of those orders and getting ready. But we're also trying to look ahead and see what we need to do to harden it so that we're not facing a situation like this again. You know, we had Irene, and now we've had Sandy. Uh, what would happen? I mean, if we got hit by a third like this, have, have, has the infrastructure been changed in any way? Have you learned lessons uh, so quickly and valuably that, that you've employed different strategies where you could resist or respond any better than in the previous two? Well, I think two things. Yeah, first of all, we did learn a lot from Irene. We learned a lot from the snowstorm last October that we had that was challenges. And, and certainly the, the game has changed from New Jersey. Uh, I don't want to get into a climate discussion, but I can tell you this. Hurricanes are not turning left into North Carolina. They're turning left into New Jersey. And now we have to rethink everything we do. So uh, we're not just looking at what we need to do from an equipment standpoint, but also from a process standpoint. And what we've done recently is, even during this storm, is we flew people up from Florida Power and Light who had the expertise in how we and how they respond to storms, and we've utilized a lot of the processes as we've gone here. So it's been very helpful to us, and, and we're going to continue that learning process. What's the biggest difference between what FPNL does and, and what you do in, the, in terms of process? Well, you know, it was little things. Uh, it, was, it was everything from where they placed the, uh, the porta johns when the, when the crews were leaving in the morning that we had that were mutual aid crews, and how we got crews back and forth from buses from their hotels to their trucks. So just the way they staged the trucks when they came in at night, how they parked them. Those were little things, but they improved the productivity for us dramatically, and we were glad to have their help. On top of all this, let's talk about LIPA for a second. You enter into an sure. agreement, PSEG did, uh, last December, to take over, as I understand it, the operations, essentially, on Long Island. Uh, nobody's taken more heat, pardon the pun, than LIPA. And there's talk about major changes, perhaps dismantling the authority as it exists right now. Is that deal going ahead, as far as you know? And are you content, knowing what you know about what's happened on Long Island, to be going ahead with this deal? Well, yeah, I mean, again, it's a, just a management contract, so it's not something where we're purchasing assets and we're worried about the condition, but we do believe we can bring a lot of the processes there that we have in New Jersey that have been successful. I mean, if you really step back, Long Island shows us over every other utility in the United States, several of them locally here who were finalists to take over the management of that system. So. You know, our employees are proud of that. They think they can bring some processes there that can help out. And anytime you can help folks out and try to improve things, we're, we're willing to step up and do that. Well, we appreciate you taking the time. We know you're busy, and we thank you for coming on, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Governor is getting a lot of praise for the way that he handled Hurricane Sandy. Look at these new poll numbers. 69% of the New Jerseyans polled, and this one said he did very well. The latest Rutgers Eagleton poll, 23% said he did somewhat well. The new Fairleigh Dickinson poll of registered voters shows 77% say the governor did a good or excellent job. And look at the new Quinnipiac poll. 89% of New York City voters gave Governor Christie a good or excellent rating and said that he did better than Mayor Bloomberg. Governor Cuomo, and President Obama. The governor and first lady are being praised as well for their Hurricane Sandy New Jersey Relief Fund. We talked about that in part two of my conversation with Mary Pat Christie, which begins when I asked her if all of this has suddenly changed their lives. 
No, it really didn't. I mean, I think that Chris has typically been an executive who seizes on the moment and really tries to, uh, you know, figure out the best way to solve problems. So it wasn't anything unusual for us because we've seen Chris work in these situations. I mean, nothing as tragic as this or as um, catastrophic as this. Did you see a side of this man that you, as long as you've known him, that you didn't see before? Um, Probably not, because I've seen he's a very, you know, compassionate person, and clearly his compassion was front and center uh, for certainly that first week and really the first two weeks of, of uh, the aftermath. So I didn't see something I haven't seen before, but I think maybe the rest of the country and certainly the rest of the state um, probably hadn't seen the compassion that, that Chris so exemplifies when he's one-on-one -on -one with people. I love the hugging suffering. and the closeness. And it's so, it's so Chris. I mean, you know, he often jokes about his uh, Irish father and his Italian mother, but there's a, it was a very, a lot of hugs go on in the Christie family, so. The other thing that we heard so much about was the reaction in this state and around the country to the way the governor and the president interacted. Mm -hmm. there, there's, there are those who say, though, you know, this didn't go over well prior to the election. Did the governor ever come home and say, I know I'm going to take some heat for this? Did he ever, did he ever have a moment where he felt or expressed any sort of sense of like, this is good for the state, but politically this may be difficult? No, he really didn't, Mike. I mean, I can't tell you that how just engrossed in the tragedy our whole lives became, honestly. I mean, Chris, from, from 7 o'clock in the morning till, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night was focused on this storm. So I don't even think it entered his mind. He certainly didn't discuss it with me. Um, we certainly were just proud of the fact that the president was coming to our state and proud of the fact that we could, you know, showcase our state and the, and the need that we had. He frequently references you in press conferences, as you, as you obviously mm -hmm. know, uh, which leads to the question I must ask. Do you, do you discuss a lot of the issues with him? Do you go over a lot of this, well, uh, we, the, the we, business of the state? We discuss our days. We both mm -hmm. do. He knows what I'm doing at work. Uh, he knows what's going on with the children. And I certainly know about his days. Um, you know, do we get into policy? We certainly don't get into the nitty gritty, but if there's interesting things going on, I, I hear about them. So when he talks about the power being out at your house and also at Drumthwacket, and he says he heard it from you. Yes. He heard it from you. He did, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> were, you, were you surprised at how long it took the state to get the lights back on? Not really, because um, I, I mean, there were so many people without power. I think I heard 7 million at one point uh, on the immediate aftermath. So the fact that even after a week we were down to, you know, I think less than a million, um, it, it was a huge job. I mean, and we had utility companies from all over the country, and I'm sure everybody has a story about the utility company from Michigan on your road or Tennessee or Ohio. So. I mean, I think that we did the best job we could, um, given the circumstances and the enormity of the, the crisis. There are some who see this kind of as a unifying experience. Do you mm -hmm. think so? I think you can say, you can certainly see how neighbors, I mean, my own neighbor started cutting up trees that were covering our driveway. My neighbor, the next day, came out with his chainsaw and cleared three trees from our driveway so that we could use our driveway. Um, so that's an example, just one example. So many people and communities across the state are doing that, or and, were doing that. And, and when you got the charity set up, mm -hmm. um, corporate New Jersey really seemed to jump right in. Did you have Absolutely. to twist a lot of arms? Did no, I have to tell you that, that I've made phone calls in the past for fundraising, Mike. I've never had such a positive response to my phone calls. and. Um, I can't say enough for the, the heartfelt feelings that are out there for the state and everybody wants to help. And you're right, it goes to the lemonade stand that you know someone in California ran and their father matched two to one. We got a check for $711 and, and something cents, but um, there's definitely been an outpouring and a real want, want to help. And the fleece, the famous fleece. The fleece? <laughs> Governor's on Saturday Night Live joking about the fleece. Does the fleece have a special place in the closet now? <laughs> will, I don't will know. It, will it... <laughs> the fleece is often around. <laughs> Mrs. Christie, thank you so much for coming. Oh, you're in. my pleasure, Mike. Thank you.
Well, that does it for us. Coming up tomorrow, an inside look at New Jersey's economy. The CEO of Toys R Us tells us what's hot for this Christmas. Plus, we're going to take a close look at what Rutgers moving to the Big Ten will mean financially and beyond. And the challenges of trying to clean up the Newark Bay hit so hard and contaminated so badly after Hurricane Sandy. As always, we invite you to write and tell us what you think about any issue. You can find us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and check out our website at njtvonline.org. So please join us once again tomorrow. I'm Mike Schneider. Thanks. Good night. I was a good student, but I had trouble putting my words on paper. I love teaching my students to write. Okay, so the ideas are the main body of our story. It's a skill they'll use for the rest of their lives. Mr. Aston taught me to write. Now I know it better in all my classes. Teachers know how important writing is. That's why we're so proud that writing scores in New Jersey are the best in the nation. Now I love to write. Our students are succeeding. And that makes me proud to be a teacher in New Jersey's public schools. NJTV, BBC World News.